Who Killed Robert Wan? A story in two parts. This is part two, Unknown Intruder. Robert Wan has been murdered, but by whom? And why are the three men who live in the townhouse behaving so strangely? We dance round in a ring and suppose, but the secret sits in the middle and knows. According to their collective narrative, Robert Wan had arrived at the men's residence around 10.30 p.m., transported by a taxi. At that time, Victor Saborski, recently back from a business trip, had retired upstairs to his bedroom engrossed in the television show Project Runway. Coincidentally, I am also watching Project Runway right now as I am writing this episode. As for Dylan Ward and Joe Price, they purportedly engaged in casual conversation with Robert in the kitchen. They had some water before showing Robert to his designated guest room. Joe then went upstairs to the third floor main bedroom, where he shared a living space with Victor, and they settled into bed. Dylan then followed suit, retiring to his second-floor bedroom. After reading a book for about five minutes, Dylan took a sleeping pill to help him go to sleep. According to Dylan, he recalled hearing Robert utilize the hallway bathroom for a shower before the distinct sound of the guest bedroom door closing and the click of the latch resonated through the still house. During the night, Joe and Victor claimed to have been abruptly awakened by the jingle of the door chime, an audible signal triggered by their alarm system whenever an exterior door to the home was opened. Remaining unfazed, they assumed it was their fourth roommate, Sarah, returning home unexpectedly. However, their tranquility was shattered when a series of Muffled cries or grunts pierced the silence of the night, jolting Joe and Victor from their slumber. Reacting swiftly, they sprang out of bed and hastened to the second floor, where they discovered the guest room door partially open and their house guest, Robert Wan, lying on the bed, bleeding from the stab wounds afflicted upon him. Strangely, both Joe and Victor attested to hearing neither another door chime nor the sound of anyone descending the stairs during the unsettling sequence of events. The absence of such auditory clues only deepened the puzzling nature of the incident, leaving investigators grappling with an array of perplexing questions. Joe instructed Victor to go upstairs and call 911, and he knelt beside his friend, Robert Wan, his hands trembling as he desperately tried to stem the flow of blood. Joseph recounted to the police how his eyes fell upon the chilling sight of the murder weapon lying ominously on Robert's stomach. Without hesitation, he reached for it, his fingers curling around its cold handle, and he carefully placed it on the bedside table. In a perplexing twist, Joe confided to the police that they might discover his DNA on the knife, as he had handled it. But finding the DNA of the real killer might prove elusive, for they likely took precautions by wearing gloves. Joseph revealed to the authorities that he had not laid eyes on Dylan until after he had dispatched Victor upstairs to make the urgent call to 911. Victor corroborated this account, affirming that he had not encountered Dylan when they first stumbled onto the grievously wounded Robert. But Dylan emerged from his bedroom as Victor returned downstairs, still clutching the phone to his ear, engaged in a frantic conversation with the emergency dispatcher. With a shared conviction, all three men maintained that an intruder had infiltrated their home and perpetrated this heinous act that claimed Robert's life. 
They speculated that the assailant, perhaps emboldened by stealth, had breached the security fence shielding their residence. Stealthily making their way to the back door, the unsuspecting entry point to the dwelling. The investigators harbored doubts regarding this theory. Their scrutiny uncovered compelling evidence that challenged this intruder narrative. Firstly, meticulous analysis of the fence surrounding the premises revealed that it had not been disturbed. It was adorned with cobwebs and layers of dust, which had gone untouched by a shadowy intruder. Furthermore, the absence of any missing items from the house raised suspicions. Considering the presence of valuable electronic equipment strewn throughout the residence, to access the guest room where Robert Wan met his tragic end, the hypothetical intruder would have bypassed Dylan Ward's room on the second floor, implying intimate knowledge of Robert's presence that fateful night. The restricted circle of individuals privy to this knowledge encompassed only Robert's wife, Kathy, and the trio of men who lived inside of the house. Seeking additional insights, the police enlisted the aid of cadaver dogs, highly trained in the detection of blood and decaying human remains. Aside from the modest amount discovered on Robert's bed, the sole traces of blood found within the house materialized in two slightly odd locations. The lint trap of the dryer adjacent to Dylan Ward's room on the second floor and near an exterior drain situated on the back patio. The possibility emerged that someone may have cleansed themselves of blood on the patio and then traveled up to the second floor to use the dryer for their clothing. Citing an excerpt from official documentation, it was noted, By all accounts and evidence, Price, Saborski, and Ward have a very close relationship and clearly have the motive to preserve and protect the interests of one another. Each of the men willingly shared their intricate connections and the dynamics of their cohabitation at the residence at 1509 Swan Street with the authorities. Victor, forthcoming with information, disclosed that he and Joe had been involved in a committed relationship spanning numerous years. Approximately four years prior, Dylan became an integral part of their union, engaging in a sexual relationship with Joe, but not with Victor. During the investigation, the police stumbled upon an array of paraphernalia associated with BDSM sexual activities in Dylan's room. Shackles, gags, restraints, and an assortment of other toys were among the discoveries. The men candidly explained that Dylan and Joe engaged in a sexual dynamic characterized by dominance and submission with Dylan assuming the dominant role and Joe willingly embracing the submissive position. Moreover, the authorities came across a device commonly known as a milking machine in their search. This particular apparatus is designed to stimulate a man's penis and facilitate ejaculation, and it became particularly significant in the police's developing theory regarding the events, especially after they read the autopsy report of Robert Wan's body. After the horrifying incident on August 3rd, Dr. Lois Goslinowski conducted the autopsy on Robert Wan's body. The examination uncovered three meticulously placed stab wounds on Robert's torso, accompanied by the distressing discovery of a broken blood vessel in his eye indicating that he had not only been stabbed, but also smothered. Dr. Goslinowski concluded that all of the wounds had been inflicted using a similar four and a half inch blade, rendering the knife found at the scene unlikely to be the murder weapon. Intriguingly, the autopsy revealed other perplexing details. Dr. Goslinowski noticed needle marks on Robert's neck, right foot, left hand and chest, all inflicted before Robert's death. 
While routine drug scans yielded negative results, it is unfortunate that no testing was conducted for paralytic agents, and none of Robert Wan's blood had been preserved before his burial for further testing. There were no signs of a struggle evident on Robert's body. Any defensive wounds were conspicuously absent from his hands, arms, and legs. It was as though he had remained motionless and passive throughout the entire ordeal. Additionally, Dr. Goslanowski performed a rape kit examination, collecting samples from Robert's anus, the inside of his penis, rectum, and mouth. Surprisingly, the laboratory analysis revealed the presence of semen in each cavity tested. But perplexingly, all of the DNA originated from Robert Wan himself. I will say that one more time, because I find this one of the most mind-blowing parts about this case. The semen collected from inside of Robert Wan's mouth and anus all came from Robert Wan himself. Okay, let's move on. Drawing from Dr. Goslanowski's findings and the limited evidence gathered at the crime scene, the police deduced a harrowing sequence of events. It appeared that Robert Wan had been assaulted, incapacitated using a paralytic agent, subjected to sexual assault, and ultimately murdered through stabbing on the night of August 2nd. Adding to the disconcerting revelations, there existed a significant gap in the timeline. You see, a neighbor reported hearing a scream emanating from the house while watching the nightly news. Although the precise timing remained elusive at best, the television program this neighbor was watching aired from 11 to 11.30 p.m., while Victor Saborski's 911 call was placed at 11.49 p.m., indicating a substantial 19-minute gap between the discovery of the body and the notification to authorities. During their initial police interviews, Joe, Victor, and Dylan voluntarily cooperated without the presence of attorneys. A subsequent conspiracy trial featured video recordings of these interviews, shedding light on their statements. In those interviews, all three men vehemently denied any participation in Robert Wan's untimely demise and put forth the theory that a home intruder was responsible for the tragedy. Furthermore, they adamantly refuted any suggestion of a sexual relationship with Robert, a claim supported by Robert's family, who described him as categorically straight and happily married. The situation posed a significant challenge for the police as they lacked substantial evidence to definitively identify the perpetrator of the crime. Complicating matters further, Joe Price, Victor Saborski, and Dylan Ward had chosen to cease their cooperation with the investigators and promptly sought legal representation following their initial questioning. On the day following the tragic murder, the three men paid a visit to Robert and Kathy Wan's home, seeking to offer their condolences to their late friend's now grieving widow. Together, they mourned the loss, with Kathy remaining unaware of the dubious nature of their accounts of the previous night. Remarkably, Joe Price even took on the role of a pallbearer during Robert's funeral, adding an element of apparent solidarity. However, as new revelations emerged and the realization dawned that the trio residing at 1509 Swan Street were withholding crucial information, a rift began to form between them and Kathy Wan. The gay and lesbian liaison unit of the MPDC was called in three days after the murder, but Sergeant Brett Parson, the unit's head, declined to comment on their involvement. Approximately two weeks after the crime, the police made a public statement suggesting that the crime scene had been tampered with. Over the course of more than three weeks, investigators meticulously combed through the row house, 
methodically examining every detail. They went to great lengths, even removing flooring, sections of walls, a portion of the staircase, the washing machine, and even the sink traps. These thorough investigations were prompted by allegations that the area surrounding Robert's body had been cleaned. The details regarding the cleaning allegations were disclosed in an affidavit supporting a search warrant for Joe Price's offices at the law firm of Errant Fox in Washington, D.C. According to this document, which initially surfaced in the Legal Times, it was stated, Technicians were able to determine that the crime scene had been tampered with, including that the area where the victim's body was located had been cleaned. These revelations further underscored the suspicions surrounding the actions and intentions of the three individuals connected to the crime scene. The case moved slowly, and after a year had passed, the police were no closer to unraveling the mysteries surrounding Robert's death or identifying his killer. To mark the solemn occasion of the anniversary, Kathy Wan accompanied by her attorney, Eric Holder, who had a prior professional connection with Robert at his former law firm, and coincidentally went on to serve as Barack Obama's attorney general, decided to hold a press conference. The purpose was twofold, to honor the memory of Robert Wan and to reignite the stagnant investigation. In a direct and confrontational manner, Holder addressed the three men in question. For those in 1509 Swan Street, where Robert was killed, you need to truly ask yourself, truly, truly ask yourself, have I provided the police with all of the information that might be relevant to the investigation of this crime? Only you, your conscience, and your God know the answer to that question. But that is the question you must ask yourself if you care about Robert, if you truly care about his family, if you care about Kathy. Come forward and share all of the information that you have. Hoping that this impassioned plea would stir the three men to speak the truth. However, the reality of this was only disappointing. In October 2008, Dylan Ward who by this time had relocated to Miami-Dade County, Florida, and was residing in a property owned by Joe Price, was charged with obstruction of justice. Following Dylan's charges in November 2008, Joseph Price and Victor Saborski were arrested and faced similar charges. While awaiting trial, all three men were released, but were subject to electronic monitoring and curfew restrictions. On December 19th, 2008, conspiracy charges were added against the trio. During the same court hearing, the electronic monitoring and curfew requirements were lifted, and prosecutors indicated the possibility of adding additional charges related to evidence tampering. The arrest warrant affidavit for Dylan Ward, submitted by authorities, outlined their conclusion that the men had not been truthful about the events. According to the report, the evidence demonstrates that Robert Wan was restrained, incapacitated, sexually assaulted, and murdered inside of 1509 Swan Street. And there was overwhelming evidence, far in excess of probable cause, that Price, Saborski, and Ward had obstructed justice by altering and orchestrating the crime scene, planting evidence, delaying the reporting of the murderer to the authorities and lying to the police about the true circumstances of the murder. The lawyers representing the accused individuals dismissed the affidavit as speculation, innuendo, assumptions, and irrelevant inflammatory comments, maintaining their client's innocence. Joe and Victor were in a domestic partnership, and the affidavit alleged that Joe had a previous sexual relationship with Dylan, Attorney Dale Sanders speculated that the extensive affidavit was released to turn one of the housemates, potentially Dylan, against the others, 
suggesting that prosecutors lacked sufficient evidence to bring additional charges without the cooperation of one of the witnesses. Investigators believed that a kitchen knife had been staged with blood and strategically placed near the body, while a missing knife from a knife set found in Dylan Ward's bedroom would have been more consistent with the wounds on Juan's body. The autopsy revealed signs of possible suffocation, potentially by the use of a pillow, and puncture marks on Robert's neck, chest, foot, and hand. Though no toxins were detected in his blood, the absence of a struggle led investigators to suspect that Robert may have been injected with a paralytic substance. Cadaver dogs indicated potential evidence in the form of a dryer lint trap and the patio drain, suggesting someone may have washed themselves in the backyard and dried damp clothing in the dryer. On November 25, 2008, Kathy Wan took decisive action by filing a $20 million civil lawsuit against the three friends of her late husband. Her allegations were grave, accusing the men of callously neglecting Robert's plight after he was stabbed and instead engaging in a cover-up of the sinister crime, which took place in their own home. Joe Price's attorney raised concerns about the timing of the indictments, suggesting that the concurrent civil lawsuit filed by Robert Wan's family seemed untimely, casting doubt on whether prosecutors and the family's attorneys were coordinating their actions. In April 2009, prosecutors revealed the existence of two emails drafted on Robert's BlackBerry at a time when prosecutors believed Robert had already been deceased. A legal expert noted the defense could argue that this supported their claim that the murder was swiftly perpetrated by an intruder, countering the government's allegations of a prolonged and sexually motivated assault before Robert's death. Previously, court filings indicated the government's intent to release a personal profile purportedly used by Joe Price on ALT.com, a website specializing in s and practices, which, I have to say, to each their own. As long as you are a consenting adult, you have the fun that you want to have. The ensuing criminal trial commenced roughly a year and a half later, during the summer of 2010. Despite the presence of numerous suspicious circumstances surrounding the defendants, Judge Lynn Leibovitz asserted that she did not possess a reasonable doubt about their involvement in obstructing justice. She candidly expressed her belief that Ward, Price, and Saborski were undoubtedly privy to the identity of Robert Wan's killer. However, she ultimately acquitted them of all charges. In August 2011, Kathy Wan reached a settlement in her civil lawsuit with the three men, the exact terms of which remain undisclosed. In an interview with a Washington Post reporter, she provided insight into her decision, stating, I am moving on. I want to spend the next 40 years of my life focusing on good. They can rot from the inside out, from all of the secrets they chose to keep. That's their choice. I chose to move on. The police, despite lacking a concrete theory regarding the identity of Robert Wan's murderer, harbor suspicions that continue to linger. Joseph Price's brother, Michael, had a reputation for finding himself in troublesome situations. Three months following Robert's murder, an unfortunate incident occurred when Joe Price's townhome was burglarized, and it came to light that Michael Price had been involved. Although the charges against him were eventually dropped, the police began to investigate Michael's whereabouts on the night of Robert Wan's murder. Surprisingly, it was discovered that Michael, who was attending classes at Montgomery College, had missed the class he was scheduled to attend on the evening of August 2, 2006. People familiar with the prices informed the police that Joseph always endeavored to assist his brother whenever he found himself in trouble. 
This raised the possibility that if Michael had indeed assaulted and killed Robert Wan, Joe may have taken steps to manipulate the crime scene to shield his brother from imprisonment. However, there is no conclusive evidence to substantiate this theory. Alternatively, it remains plausible that the events leading to Robert's murder involved a combination of factors involving the other three individuals inside of the home that evening. Joseph Price, Victor Saborski, and Dylan Ward. While it is important to exercise caution in labeling individuals as suspects without official police pronouncements or charges, the behaviors exhibited by these three men on the night in question are undeniably suspicious. The proximity of the crime scene to the very location that they slept raises doubts about their lack of knowledge regarding what transpired. Regrettably, the truth known to these three individuals appears to be a secret they're determined to carry to their graves. Unless Joseph Price, Victor Saborski, and Dylan Ward find the courage to disclose the true events surrounding Robert Wan's death, the full extent of what occurred within their townhouse on that fateful night will likely remain forever shrouded in uncertainty. What we do know is that a compassionate and generous soul was unjustly extinguished for reasons that elude comprehension, and justice has yet to be served. This reality is both tragic and exasperating. Perhaps someday, their conscience will compel them to reveal the truth. Robert Wan's death remains one of the most enigmatic homicide cases in the history of Washington, D.C. The Washington Examiner recognized the Robert Wan case as one of the top eight crime stories in D.C. for 2008, following these arrests. The Washington Blade noted the case's significance to the gay community as it occurred within the residence of a prominent gay couple a local news story by WTTG Fox DC in March 2009 showcased a website dedicated to the investigation efforts of four amateur sleuths residing in the neighborhood. In the aftermath of Robert Wan's tragic passing, numerous organizations established scholarships and memorials in his honor. These include the Robert E. Wan Award for Exemplary Service by the Virginia Department of Social Services, the Robert E. Wan Judicial Clerkship and Internship Conference hosted by various D.C. area law schools, the Robert E. Wan Fellowship of the Asian Pacific American Bar Association Educational Fund, and the Robert E. Wan Memorial Trust managed by the Community Foundation of the National Capital Region. Additionally, on October 22, 2011, family and friends gathered at Barksdale Field at the College of William and Mary to commemorate Robert Wan's memory with two benches and two Chinese pistache trees. The plaques on the benches carried the inscription, Rest a while and enjoy the wonderful world around you. Referencing one of Robert's favorite songs, Louis Armstrong's What a Wonderful World. A 2016 article by Lou Chibaro Jr. in the Washington Blade revealed that Joseph Price and Dylan Ward had changed their names to Joseph Anderson and Dylan Thomas, respectively, as indicated by public records. The article mentioned Joe Price's employment with Americans for Immigrant Justice, an immigrant advocacy group based in Miami in 2013, while Dylan Ward had pursued a career as a massage practitioner and Pilates instructor. Notably, Dylan Ward, now using his new name, has been featured on the website of the Pure Pilates Studio in Fort Lauderdale as recently as 2023. On the other hand, Victor Saborski retained his original name and continued working for the Milk Processor Education Program, 
a trade association representing the dairy and milk industry in Washington, D.C. Victor's association with the organization extended at least until 2020. Property records at the time indicated that Joe Price and Victor Saborski owned a house in Miami Shores, a suburb of Miami, Florida. Finally, in 2023, director Jared P. Scott released a documentary titled Who Killed Robert Wan? on Peacock, delving deeper into this case. You can watch it if you have a subscription to Peacock Plus. Sadly, I do not. As this episode on the bewildering murder of Robert Wan comes to a close, we are left with lingering questions and a sense of unresolved mystery. The enigma surrounding Robert's tragic fate continues to haunt the minds of those who have delved into this puzzling case. In our pursuit of the truth, we have explored the intricate web of evidence, testimonies, and unanswered queries that have shrouded this investigation. The twists and turns have led us through corridors of speculation, leaving us with more questions than answers. The secrets buried within the walls of that fateful townhouse in Washington, D.C. may never fully reveal themselves. In the midst of uncertainty, let us heed the wise words of Louis Armstrong. Rest a while and enjoy the wonderful world around you. I'm John Dodson, and thank you for listening to another episode of The Secret Sits. We dance round in a ring and suppose, but the secret sits in the middle and knows. Today's episode of The Secret Sits was researched and written by the host, John Dodson. All episodes are engineered and mixed by me, Gabriel Dodson. Check the show notes for links to all of our social media. Email us at thesecretsitspodcast at gmail.com. And don't forget to leave us a five-star rating and review on Apple Podcasts.